you have to actually be out of your head to commit something so dreadful. He was in a rage and he wanted to hurt the person. When I arrived on the scene, there was blood streaming down the road. How do we know he's not going to do it again? We're just going to monitor him taking his medication. All that he has to have a bad couple of days and not take his medication, then he'll go off the rails again. Cape Town's Ocarp Severe, a twisting mountain pass to Cape Point, the southern tip of the Cape Peninsula. On the 12th of June, 1999, the stretch of road became a late-night racetrack to tragedy that changed the lives of two families forever. How different it could be if he hadn't have been on the road that night. Those few seconds earlier or later would have meant I still would have had a husband and uh, everything would have been as it was. Saturday night in Cape Town. Sales rep Kevin Duncan was hosting clients at a restaurant. His wife was away with their three children. At the same time in a nearby suburb, league hockey player Graham Eady and his wife Wendy were at a function to raise funds for his hockey club. Afterwards, the couple went out to dinner with friends. When people are severely intoxicated, the court record shows 13 beers and some Irish whiskies. That's a lot of alcohol, even in somebody who drinks a lot. And one of the complex things about alcohol is that it does impair people's judgment. It impairs your ability to stop what you want to do. In the early hours of the morning, Graham and Wendy Eady fetched their two young sons from the babysitter and made their way home to Fishhook on the other side of the mountain pass. 54-year-old Kevin Duncan's home wasn't far from the Eadies. He chose the same route home, along one of Cape Town's most dangerous roads. Flashing behind me. Just don't drive too fast, the kids. What happens if it's a hijacker? What an idiot. Don't overtake him. Just keep back. But he's slowing down. No, Graham, just back off from him now. <laughs> One man, a racing champion with a passion for motocross. No, this guy's right on. The other, right. a man with a history of violence who was struggling with financial, marital, and emotional problems. This guy's been crazy, man. The killer's version of what happened next is the only story that yeah, but survives. He's slowing down now. He's just overtaken me now. He's slowing down. This car was tailgating him, and then he would drive slowly in front of him. And what I could uh, figure out that the two of them overtook each other several times. Uh, they uh, went down Okaap Severe and passed through the first set of um, traffic lights at Sun Valley. And at the next intersection, at the Skomiki and Okaab Sevech, that is where the traffic light was allegedly red. It's where the men's fates collided. As Edie got out of the car in a rage, Wendy Edie drove off with her sleeping children on the back seat. He said he smashed the windows with the office stick but he denied him having assaulted the man with the office stick. But if you look at injuries that the deceased sustained, it's, it's obvious that he must have assaulted him with a stick. It was horrific. I mean, you know, to beat somebody with a hockey stick in a car, to pull him out, to jump on his head, to have your footprint in his head that they actually took a, you know, a, a sample of, proved that his foot was there on his head. I mean, all of that, uh, it's not a human being that does that to another human being. You have to actually uh, be out of your head to commit something so dreadful. A young man on his way home saw the attack in the distance and drove to the nearest hospital to get help. Gareth Hill is the person who saw the incident. He was there when it took place. And according to him, it was absolutely a vicious attack with the hockey stick. He saw 
the hockey stick being lifted and uh, to hit my husband and that. And he saw my husband throw up his arms like this, uh, you know, like to protect himself. So he wasn't expecting anybody to come into the door. Uh, you know, he obviously didn't think he'd done anything wrong. Some people might refer to that as overkill, which is a, an expression that's used to denote an intense emotion at the time of the commission of the crime. And certainly it implies an intense emotion. And he was in a rage and he wanted to hurt the person. He scattered several fractures. And if I just remember back what, what, what his face looked like, his face was badly swollen. And then there was blood all over. When I arrived on the scene, there was blood streaming down the road. I didn't even go and identify him because they said it would not be you know, for me to have a look at because it wasn't Kevin. Wendy Eady had turned around after driving off. Graham! Graham! Get into the car! She claimed she called her dazed husband back to the car and took him home. I don't think I could have sat with my husband if he had done what he did. I don't think I would have been with my husband. I don't think I could have forgiven him for doing what he did to a person. And also, in the back of my mind would have been, why didn't I try to help on that night? Why didn't I? What was wrong? It was three in the morning, but Edie decided to return to the intersection and pretended to be a bystander. He had an ulterior motive. He lifted Kevin's body while the police were taking statements and that he took the other half of the hockey stick out from under Kevin, so that's how callous he was. Um, and he was in his right frame of mind to actually have thought to come back and get his what he had left behind. People started gathering at the scene as Edie pretended to call for help. Then that the police excused him. They took down his particulars and they, they excused him and he left the scene. But instead of returning home, Edie found a secluded area and tossed the hockey stick into the bushes. He then returned to his house and hid his bloody clothes. When I was called up, I insisted I wanted to, to speak to him because I just had a gut feeling that he might have had something to do with it. I just found it very suspicious and I insisted that they get Mr. Edie to come back to the crime scene. But then I discovered that Edie was walking around with a pair of jeans that was blood spatters on it. The tow truck driver in particular said there was a big blood patch on, the, on one of the knees of the jean. Uh, I requested him to also bring me that pair of jeans. That was the only way they caught him. So it's the fact of the person coming back to see what they've done as in lots of these crime stories, isn't it? They come back and they get caught. Graham Eady returned with his jeans in a plastic packet. They were clean. Once again, he was trying to throw police off his trail. I obviously went back to him, questioned him, and I actually threatened him with the rest. I said, look, something just does not add up. And he insisted that was the jeans. The others on the scene insisted that the jeans he had been wearing earlier had been bloodstained. Then he started to appear very edgy and, and sort of but disorientated because I, I think he realized this is it for him as far as this, this crime is concerned. So I, I suspect that he probably heard that I said that to the witnesses, I, 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 I'm going to arrest him. So I took him aside and he said, look, Captain, I did it. I killed the man and I'm, I'm willing to, to work with you guys. We actually first went to his house where we informed his wife what transpired that he admitted killing Kevin Duncan. The whole family was traumatized and everybody was crying, including Edie. We started searching the house because he could not produce the jeans, the pair of jeans. We searched the dishwasher, the washing machine, the bin in the kitchen, just about everywhere. Until we turned the main bedroom upside down and the pair of jeans popped up under his pillow. There was just no sign of the hockey stick. Graham Eady finally broke down and said he would help police find the murder weapon. 
he realized obviously he's, he's in a lot of trouble. So he was crying from time to time, even on our way to go look for the hockey stick. It, it was in the early hours of the morning and dark and we, we couldn't find the hockey stick at all. The next morning, as the sun came up, we were out there. There was thick, thick bush here. And as he explained at the time, he just tossed the hockey stick out of the vehicle. This is where we searched for the stick and where we found the bottom section of the stick. We summoned the police dogs, but we could never locate the rest of the hockey stick. Graham Eady was released on bail and pleaded not guilty to murder and defeating the ends of justice. His high court murder trial began a year later. I've seen bad murders, but I haven't seen something this bad. The case was widely publicized. I cannot recall any ro road rage incident in the Western Cape or in South Africa so well publicized before that at all. Karen Duncan was in court every day. I didn't want to let Graham Eddy think that he'd won. It was, it was hard. Uh, it, it took every ounce of strength I had to get up every morning and appear there. But I wanted to be there for Kevin. I'm not a weak person, and in a way, I didn't want to hear what had happened to him. But in the other, obviously, you don't get any peace until you do know what has happened genuinely to somebody and the reasons, therefore, which obviously was never the truth of the reasons. In the Edie matter, the defence argued that on the basis of emotional stress, provocation and intoxication, he lost the capacity to control himself and he acted in a state of automatism. Non-pathological incapacity essentially says that in a moment in time, you temporarily lost your mind. But you temporarily lost your mind on the basis of something like provocation, extraordinary emotional stress, or some factor that caused you to just temporarily lose control of your actions and lose the capacity to be able to determine what is right and wrong. It was very difficult to sit there listening to it and, and to see no remorse on his face or even somebody to approach me and just say, we're very sorry what had happened, but never was that. It was always just, you know, it was, it seemed like blamed Kevin more than what had happened to him. Edie's lawyers argued that Duncan's driving caused Edie to lose control because he feared for the safety of his family. Absolute rubbish. Absolute rubbish because I was married for 31 years and I went out with Kevin for four years and I still had to see the person he was trying to describe. One is going to encounter situations that are difficult and that are problematic. And there's no doubt that to have somebody overtaking one on the road, flashing the lights, is probably frightening. The difficulty is that one then needs to act in such a way that one improves the safety of oneself and one's family and not actually enhance the danger that they might be seen to be in. And certainly the court found that his actions were not congruent with fear and concern for his family's safety. I mean, his actions were congruent with extreme anger. The judge found he did not lose control. He lost his temper in a case of road rage. All of us lose our temper at times and people become angry. And one of the key aspects that the court found is that it's not acceptable to kill someone because you lose your temper. You have to, at some point, control your actions despite being incredibly angry. Because, essentially, the court found that if we allowed people to just kill people when they lost their temper, there'd be a lot of dead people. Sorry. It was clear to me that it wasn't Kevin's fault. Uh, so that, going through that, it kind of made me realize that I was correct. It was nothing to do with Kevin. It was just he was the wrong place at the wrong time. 
the court found that it was very deliberate and very goal-directed. He was not just struck with a hockey stick. He was kicked and he was punched. So there are multiple different ways in which Mr. Ely actually killed him. And that is actually a very significant reason as to why his defense of non-pathological incapacity failed, is because he didn't just act in an aut automatic type of way, like an automaton, doing the same thing over and over again like a robot. It was much more deliberate, much more focused, much more enraged, and much more purposeful than that. And as a consequence, much more brutal. Graham Eady was found guilty of murder and defeating the ends of justice. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison. He secured an early release after six years behind bars. I think he played a very good role to get out and to have found the Lord or whatever it was that he found there, apparently. Uh, that was what I heard, that he'd found the Lord and uh, He'd been a model prisoner and he was running the sports section of the prison. I don't know how he managed that, but he seems to be able to hold himself in control when he wishes. And when he doesn't, he lets it all hang out, so. For most prisoners, they are exposed to enormous levels of violence. They're exposed to horrifying things. They have a completely different way of existing to existing in a normal world. Prison is not a psychiatrically or psychologically beneficial place for people. What it does is it effectively keeps people away from the rest of society and thereby protects society. Graham Eady was a free man in 2006. His parole ended in 2009. It was a Friday morning at about quarter to eight. I'd just been to the post office to empty my, let, my post box. And I'd, coming back from a coffee shop, I came up towards the main road. Uh, the robot changed and I got a green arrow which gave me the right to feed into the traffic from the left. The next thing I heard this hooting behind me and this little white bucky was trying to force me off the road. I could see him gesticulating to me and then what he did was he, he aimed his car at me, tried to force me off. Eventually he speeded past me, jumped on his brake and stopped in front of me. I have a green arrow. Stupid. Are you I have fucking a fucking stupid. I've got a green arrow, man. I've got a green arrow. Fuck off, you puss. I had a green arrow. It's all right. I've got it all on camera. Fuck that. There was no discussion, no argument, there was nothing. Well, he punched me in the face. He broke my dental plate and he loosened three or four of my teeth in my mouth, uh, which have to be strapped together. I had, at that stage, I had this little dash camera in my car and I wasn't sure whether the thing was working. I'd only had it for a short period of time, so I wasn't sure whether I had his registration number or anything. So I decided that, look, I better get his registration number. And I followed him at a safe distance and found that he lives not very far from where I stay. He pulled up outside his house on the wrong side of the road and I stopped about 50, 60 metres behind him and proceeded to write down the registration number of his car. He then jumped out of his car and came charging down towards me, verbally abused me again. And I said to him, you know, I've got this all on the dash on the camera, it's all been recorded. At that stage, he swore about my camera and then stuck his hand through the, my passenger side window and ripped the camera out of the car. After that, he just marched back to his car and I decided I'd better get out of here and I drove straight away to the police station. Graham Eady persuaded Ray Scott not to lay charges. At that stage, I didn't know who my assailant was. I had no idea whatsoever. And the next thing, a gentleman came in there and he shook my hand and he said, I'd like to apologize. I don't know what happened, but I'm sorry for what I did. And he then proceeded to write out a full scale page apology to me saying that he had no reason to attack me in any way. He couldn't explain his actions and he was very sorry for what he did. And he would reimburse me for any expenses I might have. 
And then I came home and told a friend of mine about the incident. And he said, well, look, he's going to come down quick. We've got his name in the apology. We will Google and see who he is. And then we found out it was Graham Eady, much to our shock. There's been a subsequent incident of road rage, despite having been incarcerated. So what one knows for a fact is that there have been two cases of road rage in this man, and it makes it more likely that, in fact, there were more. I have a green arrow. Stupid, you fucking stupid. I've got a green arrow, man. I've got a green arrow. Fuck off, you pussy. I cannot believe he would allow himself to do it again, but it's obviously, it's inherent, it's in him. And nothing is going to change that. His anger management course, his whatever else he uh, perceives to go and do, is, he's never going to change. It's been before Kevin, it's been Kevin, it's been after Kevin, and I'm sure it won't be the last incident. Ray Scott laid charges of theft and assault. Graham Eady pleaded guilty, and his punishment included a three-year suspended sentence 130 hours of community service and 25 hours of anger management classes. Well, I'm just grateful the gentleman actually did press charges um, because uh, to me it's, it's important because it makes me know that he's done it so many times and to so many people that Kevin was completely innocent. So I feel fine. In our discussions at the plea bargain, um, his attorney said to me that they'd only recently discovered that he suffered from epilepsy. Uh, in fact, it was about three years prior to my incident and that he was on medication. And the reason he gave for him acting like he did was he had not been taking his medication. This was the cause of his violence. Certain medications that are used for the treatment of epilepsy are also used for the treatment of certain mood disorders. So one can postulate that someone may have felt that he suffers from those conditions now. Whether that plays a direct role in his behaviour when he drives a car is another question. How, how do we know he's not going to do it again? Who's going to monitor him taking his medication? All that he has to have a bad couple of days and not take his medication, then he'll go off the rails again. Karen Duncan visits her father in Cape Town as often as she can but she was forced to move in with her daughter in England six weeks after her husband's death. She is now 67 years old. I have no pension, um, and I'm working to stay, stay alive and sort of look after myself, and I'm not such a burden on everybody, and I've done many, many things. My knees have given in, I've done house cleaning, I used to do eight, nine houses a week. I've done ironing, I clean offices, I look after people with dementia, uh, people with Parkinson's, um, whatever comes my way, actually. And that's likely how it's going to be. So, yeah, he took everything. He took my home, he took my husband, he took my financial situation. There's not much left else, is there, really? <laughs>